You are tuned in to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out, and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. Tonight, my guest is Grace Shearson. Grace is the author of a wonderful new book, Zen Women, Beyond Tea Ladies, Iron Maidens, and Macho Masters. Grace is a clinical psychologist specializing in women and families, as well as an ordained Zen abbess and a Dharma teacher in the Suzuki Roshi lineage. She has been married for 41 years, has two grown sons and four grandchildren. She lives at her Zen retreat center in the Sierra foothills. So let's welcome Grace to the show now. Hi, Grace. How are you? I'm very well. And you? I'm delighted. I'm fine. I'm actually I'm in a very uh, upbeat mood today. (laughs) Uh, In the middle of your weekend. Yes. Well, it does kind of. uh, This is kind of. um, the high point of the weekend, I guess. Um, yeah. I just want to say that I, I loved your book and the detailed accounts of the women who were clearly standing in their own power in a time when it wasn't encouraged. Yes, um, it's, isn't that wonderful, that the example? Yes, it really is. And we're going to get into more about how you dug that up and where it came from. And, you know, uh, it does seem that when we investigate into our past, it, it appears that the feminine aspect of the females, the women, have been written out of history, especially with spirituality. Um, what prompted you to write this book, and where did you begin your research? Well, what prompted me to write the book was one of the women at the Berkeley Zen Center where I practiced asking why there were no images of women. It came as a surprise because we'd all been looking at that for 20 or 30 years uh-huh. in the Zen Center, but we hadn't thought to ask and even to consider it. Uh, so immediately um, I started looking around when I made a trip to Japan and I found little images, but as I uh, entered the practice more deeply and um, became ordained as a priest, I realized I didn't know how to embody the role of priest. You know, we choose our professions by role models, and I didn't really have any role models in the history of Zen for the work I was taking on. And so I felt that I needed to begin the research. And the first time I went to a woman's temple in Japan, which is where I did most of my research, I heard the sound of women's voices chanting, and it was so different than the low drone of the Buddhist chanting. Mm-hmm. There's something so sweet and warm about it. So mm-hmm. I knew that I had hit the jackpot, that there actually was something versus just nothing, huh. and that uh, I would find something. Wow. Well, it sounds like you found a gold mine there. <laughs> it didn't occur to me um, that other women would be interested. This was just something I needed to know for myself. Mm -hmm. But at one point, um, I was invited uh, to a conference on female ancestors, and there were several scholars there who were invited to talk about their translation work. And I realized that there were women who were translating uh, the female masters from China and Japan. Mm. And now, uh, because of our um, feminism in the West, we now had women scholars who were doing this research in Chinese and Japanese, and so this was unfolding before our very eyes. Wow. Uh, it sounds as if, um, you were, as you write in your book, uh, that the, uh, Zen, the female Zen ancestors had been erased from the official accounts, um, that uh, some of these scholars were able to translate from other countries uh, accounts that had been uh, here, heretofore not uh, translated and made available. 
Right. That they were, you know, sort of like the women's NBA uh, league. They were considered um, not as important as the male league. Huh. So uh, it's very interesting, too, the parallels in this country because um, the fe- all the female scholars I know who began uh, studying or uh, trying to find the trail of the female ancestors were told by their mentors and their superiors in the academic world that they should give up this silly work and look for the great male masters, that they should use their translation skills to translate the gr- great male Zen masters and leave the silly work of translating the women um, Zen masters alone. Wow. Um, were there any uh, that you found, uh, of course there are uh, some, that you found that were uh, equal to or even greater perhaps in their uh, teaching abilities and their uh uniqueness in teaching their students do you have stories of because we've all heard the story about the zen master that smacks the student with a bamboo stick and he falls out of the window and breaks his legs and things uh, <laughs> yeah but that I, generally didn't didn't go over well if women did it so, <laughs> no <laughs> you, so usually um their teaching methods were um uh, m- broader, and uh, I don't mean to make a pun, but they, they had many more <laughs> teaching methods. Yeah. Many more teaching methods, and um, they were very, most of the teachers, uh, the female teachers that made a big impression were very clever with words. Oh. So, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen the book Woman's Word. It also is Woman's Sword. Uh, the fact is that women, although we're not physically as strong as men, um, we all know that, right. uh, have a different kind of strength, both in our ability to endure discomfort and pain and mm. in our ability uh, to speak. And so um, this was, uh, I think, really a high point of some of the women teachers now, there was one woman teacher that I had never seen translated into English before that I, I found a scholar to help me translate for the first time. And she lived in the 17th century in Japan. And she was as powerful during her day as the prime minister of Japan was in, during wow. his day. So she was a spiritual advisor to the shogun. Mm. Now, when, when I even tracked down that she still had a temple that existed today, uh, Sai Shoji in Tokyo. Her name is Soshini. Um, when, when I uh, conjectured with one of the Japanese scholars as to why she had been erased, he tended to agree with me. You know, the, the Zen masters are uh, powerful images as cowboys, and they're kind of conquerors, and they themselves are unconquered. On the other hand, Soshini, who had a very powerful spiritual teaching and was very powerful during her day, had a story of being divorced by her husband. Maybe this had to do with the father having Christianity in his background and the shogun ruling that uh, if you had Christianity, uh, had had the belief of Christianity in your background, which your father did, um, you would be shunned in some way by the aristocracy. So she was divorced, she lost her husband, and then uh, her second husband, um, and this is pretty unusual for a 17th century Japan to be divorced, very uh, shaming. And her second mm. husband lost his uh, wealth and was um, reduced to uh, poverty. So, you know, these women who were married, and belong to men and were cast off, there's a certain kind of uh, shame uh, on them. Some of them uh, were actually concubines. And because of this uh, double standard of women who've sort of been conquered sexually or in some way uh, tainted by the world, they don't have that same flavor of being the conqueror that the Zen masters do it. And that's a very powerful image. It really lines up with the Western image of the cowboy. Mm, interesting. Interesting. And, of course, the, the women would have the intuitive side uh, developed more uh, intimately, and the male would probably have to work on that to, uh, to gain those, that, the right-brained uh, insights that the, that yes. the women had, and, uh, in, you know, yes. just automatically. 
And, of course, doing meditation, and, uh, and, of course, some men are gifted intuitively, so I would say some of the spiritual leaders on the male side combined uh, the intuitive abilities and great strength and mm-hmm. power mm-hmm. and charisma. Mm-hmm. On the female side, what we see is a kind of strength, an enduring kind of courage, not not the kind of strength that you know, smites the whole uh, army, but a kind of strength mm. that can endure a lot of suffering and a kind of uh, perseverance and a kind of um, uh, ability to find her way even when she was swimming against the stream. So this kind of woman actually uh, has a kind of leadership that we don't yet have a name for. Mm. We like the intuitive and supportive strong male leader, which we generally call the strong silent type. But Mm. when we look to the uh, female side of things, what do we say about a female leader What that compares to this kind of strength and silence that we see, that we say, oh, this is the strong silent type in men. Those are the kind of Zen leaders even today that we select. It is hard Mm. for people to understand that a sort of top of nails... (laughs) Uh, and intuitive, um, very strong female. Um, what do we call that kind of leadership? Mm. I don't know that we have a name for it. Yeah. I think we call it the B word generally. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. It has a negative connotation. Well, now you mentioned perseverance and sacrifice, and I know that there were uh, pioneering nuns who made extraordinary sacrifices, uh, according to your book including uh, disfiguring themselves just for the privilege of studying with their male masters. Um, mm-hmm. what, did, what, would they, what kind of disfigurement would they do, and why, why would that be gain favor with the masters? Well, one of the things uh, that we see historically in all of the different traditions, I've seen it in Catholicism and Taoism as well, I don't know so much about the other traditions, and in Buddhism in several cases, where women uh, have to convince their family or someone that they are not desirable as a sexual object and that Mm. they have themselves transcended the use of seduction and beauty Mm. as a means to power and that they are willing to move beyond that. Mm. So in the case of uh, Buddhist women, the Buddha himself had determined that uh, he wanted men and women to practice in separate practice places. In the case of some of the women in Japan, uh, it's kind of like separate but equal in the United States. Yes, they should have separate but equal places to practice, but there weren't uh, any convents and there weren't any substantial teachers for them. So these women who wanted to get to the bottom of what did life mean and really wanted to apply themselves to a Zen practice would have to go to a monastery. In some cases, uh, they were refused by... Uh, the guiding teacher of that monastery, and so uh, in a couple of cases, they took um, a hot iron to their faces and um, then reapplied, showing the teacher, I can't change the fact that I'm a woman, but I want you to know that using my feminine wiles is not an option for me, and I'm mm. not why I'm... So they could not transcend the fact that they were women, but they could transcend the stereotypes that people had about women as a seductress. Interesting. Interesting. And, of course, the men didn't have to do that with their with their uh, prowess and their ability to rape and pillage. That was all right and acceptable. Um, well, uh, it wasn't acceptable once they took on the Buddhist precepts, but um, those kinds of qualities, those samurai kinds of qualities, uh, were not considered a flaw, which is so much the better for women. In a certain way, they had to be enlightened before they could even enter training. Um, I said to my own uh, teacher in Japan that I felt that it was um, not doing men a service to allow the male monks um, to have a priority treatment to the female practitioners at the temple that I was practicing at because, after all, we had derived so much benefit from being mm. discriminated against. We had really learned how to uh, practice anyway, and men should have that opportunity too. It would be good for them. 
Yes, yes. We were getting, we were getting all the good uh, spiritual.